as we take up this chapter in Daniel, I off speak of this with, with my old personal discouragement. There are certain sections of scripture that in prevailing Christianity get relegated to children's Sunday school. And that's, that's where you hear about these things. And, and the sad thing is then it can start to crop up into our mind that somehow those passages are, are for the children, for the little ones. There's no passage that's exclusively for the children and the little ones. And further, I want, when we look at this today, I think we'll realize that its pertinence and application is exceedingly relevant for you and I. Now, when we take this up, this is it, those of you who have been doing the McShane reading program ha, have been reading through the book of Jeremiah. And as you're coming to the end of the book of Jeremiah, uh, that's talking about all of these events that are taking place in Daniel. The book of Daniel is really the end of all that was going on in Jeremiah as he brings Nebuchadnezzar and, and he takes over that whole area. There was a holdout for a long time where Jerusalem was fighting and holding out. And they were struggling as, as one by one towns fell to Nebuchadnezzar. Not only far, but even within Israel and even within Judah. Until eventually here it tells us in chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, this Jerusalem was also given over. Now, how that happened, I encourage you to go back and read in Jeremiah how there was a breach in the town and all of those things that, that took place. It's very interesting. This event happened way back in 605 BC. But one of the things that I want to always impress upon you, as we are God's people, we've got to remember, we are God's people. This is God's word. And, and so it has great relevance and it has great application to us. But we've got to remember, it is more than anything else, God's revelation of himself. That we might know him. Now one of the things that, that also it gets to me, not only do passages sometimes get relegated to Sunday school that I think should get far more mention and application, but also there is a tendency for us to focus on the human hero or character in the story. Now, when I read through this chapter, and I think, and I would hope that when you read through it, we would begin to see something very strong in there, and I'm going to just point this out as we begin to launch into this. Listen as I read the beginning parts of three verses in this chapter. Verse 2, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Verse 9, and God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief eunuch. Verse 17, as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. Now, what, I, what did you notice about those three verses that I read? God gave, God gave, God gave. So the, uh, the overwhelming central character in Daniel chapter 1 there are secondary characters, strong supporting characters. But Daniel chapter 1 is not ultimately the story of Daniel. It is the story of God's unfolding purposes in the history of Judah, in the history of the world with regard to Nebuchadnezzar, and in the personal lives of Daniel and his three dear friends. And so there can be a danger when, when our focus is, is just on Daniel, though there is much that is commendable in Daniel. I want us to see this. God gives. This chapter, again, reveals that God's absolute providence over all. God is the one who gives. God is the one who withholds. God is the one who purposes all things. There is a battle that has taken place. Now, if you read about this battle, Nebuchadnezzar, they'd come up against them. 
and then they had been pulled away to fight some other battles and, and Judah thought, oh, we're good, we've escaped, it, it's not going to come upon us. Only to find out, no, the Lord is going to give him victory there and then bring him back and then hand you over. And what, what they were needing to learn, even they were being told, if you're in Jeremiah 31, uh, those of you who run away, you're going to die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence. But those who stay and give up, surrender to King Nebuchadnezzar, you will live. And God will take care of you. And it's like, what? How, how, so how are all these, these events taking place? It's important to know this. It isn't simply that King Nebuchadnezzar is stronger it isn't that he's wiser. Whether there is a victory or a loss, that is all entirely in the hand of God. The wording of the scripture is very important. Remember, you can see so many times, as we were even looking at in Judges, where there was a battle uh, of... Uh, all of these people coming against Barak and Deborah and the children of Israel, where they had 900 chariots. Seemingly undefeatable odds, but then God is able to render that powerful weapon useless as he gets it muddled down in the mud so that they can't attack like they would and they end up being decimated by what would have seemingly been a weaker army. And there are examples of that throughout all of the scriptures where, where you're reading and on certain days, God brings the battle in different ways. Sometimes one man can put to flight a thousand. Some days uh, they stand, they go to stand for the battle. And I'm astounded when you look at this and God says, today you will not fight. You will just come and stand and look, and they go out to look at the soldiers, and God turns these different armies that have gathered together against the children of Israel, God turns them into confusion, and the scripture says, they turn their swords against one another till not a man of them was standing. It's like, wait a second. So... The children of Israel then go across and they collect all of the booty and all of the treasure that was left there. And you think, how do they do that? Well, the victory doesn't belong to the strongest army. The victory does not belong to the smartest soldier. The victory is not ultimately linked to the weaponry or circumstances. It's not linked to strategy. Sometimes God required strategy of them. Other times not. And in every way, we should be learning as we read through the scriptures, the battle belongs to the Lord. The race is not to the swift and the war is not to the horses. It, it, it is all the hands of God. And that's why it says again here in verse 2, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. Now that's important, with some of the vessels of the house of God. Because the tendency of natural man, even at that time, would have been this. Nebuchadnezzar came in. He came into Jerusalem. He defeated them. He went into the temple. He took sacred items out of the temple and he took those sacred items back to his land and put them into the house of his gods. So in the tradition and mind of the world, proof, his God is stronger than the God of Israel. Well, the scripture makes it very clear to us. The reason why Nebuchadnezzar got these sacred items is not because his God was stronger. The reason he got these sacred items is what? The Lord gave them. The Lord gave the king, the town, the city, the temple, and the sacred vessels of the temple. The Lord is the one who gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Got to understand this. The world is going to constantly interpret their experiences in so many different ways. The pagans will claim their gods. 
Even we know those who, those who follow false religions, if they have a success in business or if things go well in their life, they attribute their success and their victories to their false gods, which is not actually the case. The scriptures go through all along to remind us there is no God but God. And everything that is happening in every place is happening at the behest and purposes of God. One of the rich things also, as you do read through Jeremiah and Ezekiel, is you see God not only pronouncing judgments against Israel and Judah in their apostasy, but God is pronouncing judgments against Babylon, against Tyre, against Sidon, against the Amalekites. I mean, God is pronouncing judgments against everybody. How can God be so confident that he's going to be able to carry out what he wants in all of these different countries and in all of these different places, even when they don't recognize him, even when they don't worship him? How is he so sure that he can overcome their wills, overcome their weapons and overcome their supposed gods because he alone is God and none can withstand him the Lord gave into the hands I mean I love the way that it states it in Lamentations chapter 3 verse 37 and following God's word says this who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord commanded it Someone says, I'm going to start a company. I'm going to start a business. I'm going to invest in this. I'm going to uh, go to war against this, this other country. Who has ever made a claim and accomplished it all on their own? What the scriptures are telling us here is no one has anything that anyone has ever said and then actually accomplished is only because God himself commanded it. God allowed it. God permitted it. And so that's why one of the challenges is this. In Romans chapter 1, speaking of the unbelieving world who suppress the truth and righteousness, they should be giving glory to God. But they exchange the glory that should be given to God with, with creation and things in the image of creation, making their own gods and making their own ideas. The reality is this, no matter what happens in this world, God deserves glory. In every victory, in every accomplishment, in everything. And when there is not victory, when there is defeat, when there is loss, who commanded it? And the scriptures say, remember this, in the day of prosperity and in the day of adversity, remember, God has made both. <laughs> Go on with me and, and we see the scope of it, not only in, in terms of the, the, the practical big things of human events. I mean, because some people, the deists, like to think of God sort of as, as, as big, you know, and, and the momentous events, he's kind of holding sway over those things. But the scriptures are far stronger than that. We know that it goes down, to, as we come to the New Testament, not a sparrow falls from the sky, and it's, it's worthless. He, he knows the numbers of head on, hairs on our head, all of the details specifically, but even our own personal experiences. Look again with me at, at verse 9. God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Now, again, it's very important for us to recognize this. Why was he favored? Now, our logic might be like this. Well, Daniel was, based on the selection process, he's a good-looking boy. I mean, they chose the blemishless ones, the better-looking ones. Uh, he, he was smart. He was probably courteous, hardworking, thoughtful. So because of all of these things, that's why he was favored. 
That's how the world thinks, doesn't it? And brothers and sisters, it's hard for us not to think just like that. But what you need to do is roll it back just a smidge. How you and I look, how that's been determined, how does it work? Who controls that? Who controls how tall one is, how short one is? Uh, uh, the specific fairness or darkness of skin, who controls that? The size and shapes of nose and ears and all the variety of things, who, who controls those things? Now, we will at times have the tendency to say, uh, that's hereditary. Yeah, that sometimes happens. Um, ask my wife, if you would, to show you uh, uh, later a picture of this family in Mauritius where they have three daughters. And these three daughters, not a single one of them looks like they are related to one another. They're, they have different skin tones, they have different heights, they have different physical builds, they have different, different eyes, noses, mouth. I mean, there's, there's just nothing similar about these three, except that they have the same last name and the same mama and dada. That's it. And so, to some extent, at times, we look like things, but God is not bound to even those details. And, and the ability... To be smart, to be competent. Does everyone make the same grades? They don't. I mean, it was interesting because we were um, one of the families that I showed in the picture there that we were visiting in Mauritius. They were telling us about their son and daughter, Rudy and Letitia. And, and in that, they were telling us Rudy is lazy. He just plays video games all the time. He's not that interested, uh, that hardworking, but he gets excellent grades. He's always gotten great grades all the way through. Letitia, she works so hard. From the time she comes home, she works harder than any student I've ever seen, but she can't learn. I said, Whoa, that's... It's pretty strong language. She just tries her best, but, you know, it's a struggle. She's repeated this grade and repeated again and just, and, and the same parents in the same home with the same discipline and the same instruction, and yet one, everything comes easy to without any hard work at all. The other one, no matter how much she tries and tries and tries, she struggles to just make the passing grade. Why is that? Now, someone might want to stand and shout, unfair. But you know what? There are some, unlike Letitia, who can't talk, who can't see, who can't walk. And God has been pleased in her life where she may uh, lack in certain educational abilities. He's given her an endowment in artistic qualities. And so, how God does it is according to His secret will. He doesn't owe any of us anything, but it's important for us to know this. Whatever we are and whatever we have, God Himself has given it. Again, it is in the context, same context, verse 17. And these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom and Daniel had understanding of dreams and visions. God gave that to them. What this does also is it eliminate, ought to eliminate all pride and all boasting. Because if there's anything that you've got, even if it's better than those around you, it's not all you. God gave it to you. And I don't say this as a threat, but the reality is this. God gives and God takes away. There are some people who have sight and then they have, meet with an accident and then they are blind. There are some people with a remarkable talent and skill. But again, one disease and, and that's gone. 
And these things are stripped from them. We just so powerful to see the hand of God. But we see this not only here in Daniel. We see this throughout in Exodus uh, chapter 3. Verse 21 and 22, it says this, as God speaks to Moses concerning the children of Israel, this is even before Moses is gone and even before the plagues have begun. God telling him how it's going to work out. How can God be so sure it's going to work out how he wants it to? Yeah, he is absolutely God and everything will always work out exactly how he wants it to and it says this i will give exodus 3 21 22 i will give this people favor in the sight of the egyptians and when they go you shall not go empty-handed each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and clothing and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. They're not going to be involved in a battle, but as they leave Egypt, they're going to leave as if they have the plunder of a battle. And the way that they're going to get this plunder is they're, as they're getting ready to leave, they're going to go to their neighbors and say, yeah, I'd like your gold and silver. You know, I'd like your best clothes. And God is going to give them favor with the Egyptians, that the Egyptians will gladly give. Now, does that seem reasonable? I mean, I, I look at that and I think, okay. Plagues, devastation, illness, uh, loss of firstborns, they are going to be resentful, not favorable. But my expectations mean nothing when God has decided to accomplish something more. And that's why if you happen to read, which I will, Exodus chapter 12, it says this. And this is after the plagues. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have whatever they asked for. And they plundered the Egyptians. God said it beforehand. It really didn't seem very logically possible, but when all was said and done, what happened? It happened just as the Lord said it would. God gave them favor with the Egyptians. So again, the thought is this. Someone is at enmity with you. That enmity might exist for a reason, but God is also able to change that and turn that to give you favor with them. You may think they'll never, they'll never change their opinion. They'll never make it right. They're when we live and exist in the, in the reality of a God who is sovereign, there really is not a never. If God wills, he can change their hearts towards me. If God wills, he can change this circumstances. If God wills, he can strengthen me. He can enable me. He can provide if God wills, this enmity may continue. And I think I can't bear it anymore. But if God wills, he can strengthen me to bear up under this enmity and mistreatment. If God wills, anything that follows that is possible. There's no never. Further, even as we look... We'd be familiar with Genesis chapter 39 as Joseph is gone. It says this in Genesis 39, 3. He saw, his master saw that the Lord was with him. That's Potiphar. And the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight. Joseph again then loses favor in his sight because of the lie of that wicked woman and is thrown into jail. And it tells us this in 39, 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Again, God also gave them learning and skill, 1 Kings 4, 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond all measure. Remembering what it says as we move to the New Testament, it says this in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Who sees anything different in you? 
I mean, what makes you different from anyone else? And here's the answer. What do you have that you did not receive? Anything in your life that would be praiseworthy, noteworthy, something that you might boast in. My integrity, my character. Where did you get that from? My faith, my earnestness, my steadfastness. Where did you get that from? All of these things are a gift of God. Which again further, I might note this. If you find yourself struggling in the weariness and weakness and temptations of this world. And integrity compromises. And under temptation stumbles. Where are you going to go to find strength? To, not, to get back up after stumbling and to not stumble the next time. Where are, you going to, where are you going to find the ability to take, uh, uh, live in such a way that you show forth character and integrity and godliness in a way that brings glory to the name of your Savior? Yeah, it's not just by saying, from now on I. It is, God, from now on I so want to help me, keep me. Enable me, strengthen me, guide me, lift me up. Because in everything, we are dependent on God. God gives everything. I guess the way I would say it is simply this. His providence, that is that everything is by His hand, it is pervasive. It is over everything. It is perfect. And it is purposeful. Even when that providence is an abiding thorn in the flesh. Even when that providence ends up being a season of imprisonment or illness. Whatever it may be, we can know this. God gives and God takes. Blessed be God who is God over all. Secondly, not only is, is, does this passage reveal that God is the God who gifts, gives, withholds, and purposes all things... But secondly, the fact that really we ought, as God's people, see God as our identity. This is one of the encouraging things that, that you would see uh, woven into the culture of the children of Israel. So often the names that were given to them spoke of God, linked them to God, declared something concerning God about them. Now because of that, as they've come now and been brought over to Babylon, and they want, they want to train them in the literature of Babylon, they want to train them in the customs of Babylon, they want them to, to no longer be God's unique and distinctive people where their identity is bound up in God. The role and the commitment of Babylon is to enculture them, is to make them people who are as it says in Romans 12, conformed to this present world. That was, that was the goal. And so as part of that goal, what was done? Well, look with me at what it says in verse 6. Among the, these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. So one, we see one of the things that they do is they seek to change their identity by changing their names. Now, we, we wouldn't readily know this, so I'm going to help you out with these things. I mean, most of us, if I say, what is the meaning of the name Hananiah? What is the meaning of the name Daniel? We wouldn't necessarily know. It may be even what is the name of, and I might mention your name, and you might not even know what that means. Because we give names more commonly these days based on we like the sound or there was a relative or, or somebody with that name. But the Hebrew tradition often was a name that declared something about God, something that God is doing in our lives right now, something that God is doing in society right now. And so the name Daniel actually was, was this is what his name meant. God is my judge. I mean, so again, it is that in all else, 
and in all I face, and in everywhere I go, God is my judge. You know, I don't simply live before the king of Judah who has fallen. I don't simply live before the king of Babylon, but in all things, God is my judge. He's the one I must stand before. He's the one I must live before. So what a name. Uh, Every time, in a sense, his name would be called Daniel. It would be a reminder to Daniel and a reminder to those calling his name We stand before the eyes of God who judges all. But they sought to change his name from God is my judge to Belteshazzar. Which, um, other than being a strange sounding name that we've never heard anyone call it. We've probably met people named Daniel before. But how many Belteshazzars have you met? Right, and even though we knew the name Daniel, we may not have known what it meant. But Belteshazzar, in spite of, there's a lot of different maneuvering that goes on. But it looks like the primary meaning was simply this. um, Bel protects the king. Bel being like Baal or Baal, the name of a god in Babylon. Bel protects the king the king. So from God, the true God is my judge. Now they're trying to give him a different name that links him to a false God. And though, though he looked to God as judge over all, now they're trying to get him to see that this God protects this king. And it's almost like, haven't you seen who had the victory? Your king was not protected. But Nebuchadnezzar was protected. Bell protects the king. From now on, when you're called, it's not going to be a reminder of your God is, is judge of all. It's going to be a reminder that this God protected this king and your God didn't protect your king. Whoa. Not only that, if you go on to the uh, next name, Hananiah, Hananiah is a mean, means God has favored or God has been gracious. So again, God has been gracious. God has favored. I'll just quickly go through, the, through all the names with you. Mishael means who is what God is. You know, so one is uh, he judges all. One is favor and grace comes only from him. The other is Who can be compared with our God? Who is like our God? The last one, Azariah, God has or God is my help. I mean, what names for these four guys? God is judge. God is my help. God is incomparable. God is the one who bestows grace and favor. And they tried to change it to names of the king. For Hananiah, again, they they sought the term, they changed it to Shadrach. Which again doesn't mean much and, and, and you get weird results from a lot of different studies and it's, it's disappointing to me at times to uh, see that uh, someone says, well, this is the meaning of it. And well, where'd you get that from? Well, I heard it preached by this guy. Well, w- well where'd you get that from? Well, I heard it in a sermon once and I read it in a book once, but what was the, what was the source that told you the original? Uh... Oh, where do we go? We can't just perpetuate stories. We've got to go back and try to break down the original language. And what's interesting here is it looks like with um, regard to Shadrach that the best understanding of the term in Babylonian would speak of him as a royal or great scribe. So one was trying to take away your identity in God and in his attributes and was trying to link it with Daniel to link it to a false god. Here, trying to separate your identity from God is the one, and now find your identity in your activity, in your job, in your employment, in your undertaking. This is who I am. And their main identity is in what they do. And that happens to us too, right? Isn't it that, that there are 
people who are referred to as workaholics of sort, that their whole identity is, I do this. I've made a name in this area. I've accomplished this. And that is, again, one of the ways that the enemy in the world tries to get hold of us. Instead of seeing our identity, the primary reason for our existence and our daily breath in God. No, you live to accomplish it. You, you need to be a self-made man. You need, to, you need to, to, to establish your name, prove yourself, and, and our identity ends up being in something that we do. Further, if you go to Mishael, the, the meaning of his name is guest of the king. That's another way that people often form their identities. Instead of their identity being with God, their identity is with a particular community or companions or groups. It's so interesting. The styles and techniques that it looks like are being employed in Babylon is to dry, drag you off to paganism, to compromises, to divert you with various forms of secularism or socializing, all the different techniques so that God is not your priority identity. That can't be there. For every believer, more than being um, an accountant, more than being a, a, a governor, more than being a contractor, for every believer, more than anything else, I am Christ's. I am his and he is mine. The life that I now live in the flesh, I no longer live for myself, but for he who gave himself for me. My identity is Christ above all else. And it ought to be because the scriptures make it very clear as we look in Colossians 1, 16 and following. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominion, rulers and authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Guess who was created? You, me, everybody. Why do I exist? Why do you exist? For him. The world tries to get us to, to think for me. It's my life. I did it my way. The world focuses on that. We say, well, no, no. Nevertheless, not my will, but his be done. The, the identity of a believer and the priority of believers is different. That's why I keep reading in Colossians uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that in everything he might be preeminent. Above all. The world will try to pull us. I love the way that it's said in, in Acts as they're writing this letter that will go out to the, the various believers. It says that this letter will go, verse 17, to the remnant of mankind that they may seek the Lord and all the nations who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things. We are his, not our own. And that has to continue to, to, to grip us as an unchangeable priority. Now, moving further into this, I want to look at the third, idea, third point. So not only does God give all things, not only is God my identity, but really flows out of what we just read, God will be first. In Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, it says this, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief eunuchs to be allowed not to defile himself. So he came there, and as he came, he did not want to defile himself. God first. 
the idea of defile, it, it, it has it. Now, some might look at that and, and read the rest of it and say, say, wait a second. He became a vegetarian. So we should all, no, that's not what I'm saying. Because if you actually go, and I'm going to take you there real quick, Daniel chapter 10, verse 2 and 3, it says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks, and I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself for three full weeks. So in these early days, he did not eat the meats that were provided by the Babylonian king, but in the later days he was eating some good stuff. Now, as time went on, you know, he, he would set it off. So what's, what's the difference here? Do remember, with the children of Israel, they had a host of dietary laws. Lots of different foods they could not and should not eat. Even certain procedures that should be done to the food that they were going to eat. It was a pretty complicated procedure of which Daniel was sure these things were not being done appropriately. And therefore... I'm just not going to participate at all. Now, what it says in here, if you read it, they ate vegetables for 10 days. And as a result of those 10 days, when the steward came back and looked upon them, what did he see? They were good in appearance and fattier in flesh. Now, again, I'm sure that's not most of our motives, you know. To be, you know, you want to be, don't be a vegetarian unless you want to be fat. No, that's not what it's saying either. But the idea, it's, it's important to note this. It's not that diet that gave them the plumpness, which is the, the sense there. That, that word that's uh, translated fatty or plump or plenteous. They became plenteous fellows, you know. Uh, it wasn't that the vegetables did that or that the diet did that. It was that God was honoring their commitment not to defile themselves. Well, because God is not bound to the necessary biology and science of any matter. God is able to endow them and did endow them extraordinarily. Because it's not like the guys that they were with. Now, remember... They're all coming from Jerusalem that had been under siege. Come down to the ages. If you're, if you're reading in the book of Jeremiah, there's not even bread left. So all of these guys would have been a little bit thinner than, than would have been optimum. And God is granting for these ones a quicker recovery of their proper vitality because of their commitment not to defile themselves. But it's important. He, he didn't want to defile himself with the king's food or with the king's drink. He wanted to continue to make it so that God was first and not something further. In Daniel chapter, uh, or in now, some of the food that they might have provided might have been acceptable. And some might have been unacceptable according to the dietary standards. So complicated and hard to know that Daniel was just like, here's the easy solution. I'm not taking it. Later on, when he's in a, a position of privilege and he can order up his food how he wants it, he can make sure that what he gets is appropriate and non-defiling. But at this stage, he couldn't. But I love what it says in Jude about those who are reaching out to help and save others who are trapped in sin and struggling. It says, save others by snatching them out of the fire and show mercy with fear, hating even for the garment to be stained by the flesh. Don't even want a little bit of the filth of the flesh on me. It's kind of like what David was saying here. My goal isn't, uh, all right, there's a line and I know that if I cross that line, God's not going to be pleased with me. Daniel didn't, he, if I might have said David, Daniel didn't have the mentality that, let's see how close I can get to that line. Let's just see how close I can get. God said don't cross that line, but I'm not crossing it, right? 
I'm not, I didn't step down. I just tried, to, yeah. Is, that's not what he's doing. What he's doing is, yeah, no. What I'm going to stay back here. I'm not going to tightrope next to that line and then lose my balance and stumble in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk over here. Even if I fall headlong, I'm still on this side of the line. I don't want to have any part of that. There comes sometimes, even among believers, such a, such a push that I want to exercise my liberty. I, I, I want to show the world that Christians are cool. I want to, what? I want to show them that we have fun too. We have fun too. There, there is a joy and a peace. There, there, there is an experience that exceeds what the world knows. It's not that we should show them we can have fun doing the things that they find fun. They should look at us and say, how are they able to live without any part of this? Because we don't need it. What we've got is more, better, more glorious. That's why I love what it says in the book of Psalms, chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. He's not in their place. He's not walking with them. He's not sitting with them. He's not participating. He's not seeing, trying to make companions with the world. His identity is in Christ and Christ first. If he and as he goes to the world, he goes as one identified as belonging to Christ. There is a distinctiveness that would be shown of that one. Really, uh, I mean, it says this. I love what it says in Psalm 15, two, 2 and following. And I'll close with this. He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks the truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, does no evil to his neighbor, nor take reproach against his friends, in whose eye a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who puts out money at no interest, does not take a bribe against the innocent, who swears to his own hurt. God will be first. You know, I, I, my mind even goes to, in Luke chapter 9, it says this. He said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. I just think that is... Now, what, what, what the world doesn't understand is self-denial actually leads to a life of, of joyful satisfaction far more than self-indulgence. The self-indulgence, they, they run from one pursuit to the other and find that it, that it is empty, that it doesn't fulfill, that it doesn't abide. Jesus says, deny himself. And I just think, where is that in the world today? Sometimes people look at Daniel and they say, not all of that food would have defiled him. Why did he do that? He could have enjoyed. I mean, at least he could have said, all right, vegetables, and we're going to have the desserts. But he, he, he didn't. Well, I mean, he could have done that. Couldn't he have just pick and choose some of the dishes and not of the others? Daniel was like, no, I can't. I could, but I don't need to. These aren't the most significant things. All of this can be lived without. The, the, the modern Christianity is having this increasing tendency instead of the walk of faith and the following of Christ isn't about self-denial. It is, you want to, if you will be my disciple, I'll give you everything you ever wanted. Where Jesus says, if you would be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He goes on in chapter 14 to say, Later, that if anybody loves them, their father and mother, their children, yea, even their own life more than me, they're not worthy of being my disciples. God must be first above all else. And that's why Daniel did what he did. And so again, I just want you to slow down for a moment. It's not that we look and say, wow, good job, Daniel. Because the point is this. 
from the first things that we saw, God is the one who gives all things. When Daniel understands that God is the one who gives all things, when, God, when Daniel understands that his whole identity and existence is bound up in God, the reality is this. Of course Daniel should put God first because he is the God who gives all things, the God who gives all life, the God who, who, who gives us every ability, every opportunity, every privilege, the God who gives us grace, the God who judged Christ on our behalf, the God who is our help, who is our strength, who is our hope. The, the, to me, you look at this, and I don't want to simply praise Daniel. I think the reason Daniel does this is because of who his God is. Anyone who knows the God of Daniel ought to have the very same response that Daniel had. And I just want to note this for you. It wasn't just Daniel. There were four guys here. And all four of them had that commitment. And God was pleased to use these men to make a mark in a world that was dark and deceived. They stood for the truth. They stood for the glory of God. And God deserves that from us. So last thoughts in this passage simply Remind us of these things. Three thoughts. God gives, withholds, and purposes all things. His providence is pervasive, perfect, and purposeful. Two, God is my identity. Three, God will be first above all. Let's pray.